So the imaging techniques that are used uh, in everyday routine for uh, small bowel applications are MRI, contrast enhanced ultrasound, MDCT, small bowel follow through and enterocolysis. For the uh, due to time constraints we will focus mainly on MRI and we will do that because MRI has certain qualities um, for small bowel imaging. First of all, there is no radiation exposure involved. MRI provides both static and dynamic imaging capabilities. It's possible to do fluoroscopic studies and motility studies. It possesses direct multiplanar imaging capabilities, both projectional and cross-sectional fashion. But at the top of all these, the multiple contrast mechanisms that are available uh, might possibly uh, aid uh, uh, accurate tissue characterization. So, in order to guarantee optimal image quality, someone has to think about high-resolution imaging coupled with adequate signal-to-noise ratio. And there are some entry-level specifications in order to fulfill these requirements. Those are to use at least 1.5 Tesla MRI scanners and, most importantly, to utilize high-performance gradient systems. What about the ideal pulse sequence characteristics? It should comprise both T1 and T2 contrast. It should be applied in axial and coronal planes. It should be fast enough to permit com comfortable breath holding. It should be insensitive to artifacts formation, while fat suppression prepulses are preferable to be incorporated. And finally, last but not least, parallel imaging, which is the main method to optimize spatial resolution and scan time. What about the ideal intraluminal contrast agent that someone should use? These contrast agents should provide with homogeneous luminal, luminal opacification, clear differentiation between the lumen and the bowel wall with minimal mucosal absorption. Uh, it is preferable that it can generate not uh, a lot of artifacts. It has to be safe and cheap. What about the route of contrast administration? There are currently two main uh, methodologies, either utilizing du duodenal intubation, and that is the so-called MR enterocolysis technique, or we can let the patient ingest the contrast agent, and that is the MR enterography method. So let's start with the MR enterocolysis technique. The patient uh, is uh, undergoing duodenal intubation, and the nasogeginal catheter is uh, uh, placed uh, down to the ligament of trites, and uh, uh, the patient is placed on prone position in order to have compression effects. And uh, a hybrid type of uh, sequence like uh, TruFISP or Balanced FFE or Fiesta is applied before any contrast administration. And we do that in order to be able to examine the extra intestinal possible manifestations of the disease, keeping the bowel in a relaxed state. Following to that, a maximum amount of 2 liters of isosmotic water solution is uh, slowly infused. Uh, this water solution mostly uh, is polyethylenoglycol, and um, a dedicated single-shot turbospinaco sequence, uh, uh, thick slice like the one that we are using for MRCP studies, is utilized in order to monitor uh, the contrast infusion process. So as long as we, uh, uh, we see the contrast uh, reaching the cecum and the terminal ileum, we stop the contrast infusion and then a Cine true fisp method is applied in order to study global or local motility patterns. And this method is very important because it can give us information regarding the nature of a stenotic lesion, whether it's a fibrostenotic stricture like in this example here, or it's a soft type of uh, inflammatory type of uh, lesion. Following to that, we administer the antiperistaltic drug, and to our experience, glucagon works much better for small bowel, while buscopan uh, is more efficient for large bowel applications. So we split into two doses, 0.5 milligrams uh, of glucagon is administered intravenously, and we do that because the high-resolution TruFISP sequences potentially can be affected by, uh, and by peristaltic motion, therefore we prefer to scan these type of sequences after antiperistaltic drug administration. Following to that, the rest half of the dose of glucagon is administered together with uh, 0.2 ml per kilogram of paramagnetic contrast agents and we are acquiring 70 seconds after the administration of gadolinium
a T1 weighted sequence with uh, fat suppression, mainly for characterizing the lesions. While in the meantime, uh, in order not to lose uh, uh, time, we, we apply the T2 weighted Hay sequence, which is rather insensitive to the presence of paramagnetic contrast agent. At the end, we conclude the examination with a true FISP with fat suppression and very thin slices. So the total MR3 time is uh, a little bit less than half an hour, while the true examination time is about 10 minutes. Now, MR enterography protocol-wise is very similar to MR enterocolysis. The major difference is the fact that the patient is uh, uh, orally ingesting uh, contrast agent and we are using gastrographene water solution. Uh, we start uh, providing that to the patient 45 minutes uh, prior to scanning. And in some cases, especially when we want to have a comprehensive evaluation of not only of the small bowel, but also of, of uh, any potential colonic involvement, we repeat the examination at a late phase up to 80 minutes from the beginning of uh, contrast administration. Just to share with you some examples, this is a patient with uh, extensive uh, uh, involvement in the distal ileum uh, segment uh, with Crohn's disease, wall thickening, uh, presence of uh, deep fissuring ulcers, uh, and uh, strong enhancement in, in the mucosa are typical findings in this early phase. And we have to be really careful to avoid any potential pitfalls, especially when we are dealing with uh, non-well distended uh, bowel loops like these jejunal loops that are almost collapsed and may simulate pathology, uh, and we should differentiate them from abscesses like in this example. Now, the late phase, as already previously mentioned, could be uh, very important uh, to disclose lesions that could be found not only in the terminal ileum, which is one of the most common places of involvement in patients with Crohn's disease, but also in, in transverse colon in this example, or um, another example of uh, late phase acquisition showing uh, a severely affected uh, um, colonic segment uh, uh, showing both on true FISP and the post gadolinium 3D flat sequences. Now, optional sequences uh, uh, could be considered uh, for MR enterocolysis and enterography, and these comprise the di diffusion weighted imaging, uh, DCE for perfusion and magnetization transfer. Uh, the protocol for diffusion imaging comprises a single-shot EPI technique, either with fat suppression or with uh, an inversion prepulse. Respiratory gating or breath holding is incorporated in order to uh, cope with uh, respiratory motion artifacts, depending on the scanner that you are working with. And the acquisition, especially in, in case of MR enterocolysis, has to be done prior to an intraluminal administration, just to save some time. Multiple B-values should be acquired, especially if we want to uh, reconstruct uh, apparent diffusion coefficient maps. And this is an example of a patient with an inflammatory mass, a phlegmon, that is nicely shown on uh, high B-value uh, with bright areas, high signal intensities that corresponds to restricted diffusion as nicely shown on the ADC map. Now, in case of characterization of wall thickening, uh, Someone might expect to have uh, uh, absence of signal intensity, of bright signal intensities on B1000 when we are dealing with uh, pure submucosal edema, like in this example, or uh, main tenants of bright signal intensities in case of fibrosis. However, this is not a black and white uh, uh, case because most of the times we have coexistence of inflammation and fibrosis, and therefore diffusion uh, might be of limited help uh, by quantifying ADC values. A very interesting uh, uh, study by Korea uh, was published uh, last year, showed that uh, based on, on uh, high B-value signal, someone can evaluate whether uh, the patient has responded to treatment or not. Now, moving to perfusion, uh, DCE method is uh, incorporated uh, by acquiring dynamic multiple T1 weighted images uh, like TurboFlash, for example, with a simultaneous uh, fast injection of a paramagnetic contrast agent. We utilize parallel imaging in order to optimize uh, temporal and spatial resolution. Normally, a single dose of gadolinium is administered and dedicated post-processing software uh, is used. We are highly interested on reconstructing the so-called signal intensity over time curves from where we can extract different biomarkers like the washing rate, uh, 
the washout rate or the time to pick. And it has been shown on several studies that perfusion uh, could be of help on assessing uh, active disease, like this example, these yellow areas corresponds to increased um, perfusion permeability and therefore can be correlated with active disease. Now moving to magnetization transfer, which is an alternative so source of tissue contrast. Uh, we can achieve uh, NT effects by applying dedicated saturation prepulses where we can selectively reduce the signal of those tissues that are rich in macromolecules and uh, a quantitative biomarker that is named magnetization transfer ratio uh, has been introduced in order to quantify changes related to MT effects. So basically we are acquiring the same sequence before and after the activation of the magnetization transfer saturation pulse and as you may appreciate from this image there are uh, those areas that uh, they are rich in macromolecules like the muscles or uh, the posterior part of this fibrotic uh, uh, wall thickening is experiencing with uh, high uh, magnetization transfer ratios. And this is another example of a highly fibrotic uh, uh, wall thickening uh, that uh, uh, produces up to uh, almost 40% of uh, MTR as opposed to uh, a significantly lower MTR value that can be found on an inflammatory type of uh, wall thickening. And this is a surgical specimen from a patient with Crohn's disease where in the MTR map there is a very nice correlation uh, with high MTR values and areas uh, that are rich in uh, collagen and fibrotic areas as opposed to areas with submucosal edema that presents with low magnetization transfer ratio values. So now we have to deal with uh, uh, several clinical questions. The gastroenterologists are coming to radiologists with uh, uh, very common uh, questions like a patient that has been already diagnosed with uh, IBD in the colon, is there any small bowel involvement? And in order to respond to that kind of questions, we need to make sure that our method offers us high detectability, not only of advanced lesions, but also of early subtle lesions and therefore high spatial resolution coupled with adequate luminal distension is of paramount importance. That's why MR enteroclysis uh, is the preferred uh, modality in order to respond to this kind of clinical questions. And why is that? MR enteroclysis combines the uh, adequate luminal distension with the acquisition of high resolution true FISP uh, uh, images like in this example here, it is possible to discriminate, not only to detect, but also to characterize uh, the type of uh, fault thickening uh, on the left side, we see fibrotic fault thickening over edematous fault thickening on the right side. Now, it is very uh, consistent the possibility to detect uh, aphthous ulceration with this typical volcano type of appearance with a, a central area of high signal intensity and a low signal intensity rim, but also fissuring ulcers uh, denoted as uh, linear structures of high signal intensity penetrating the thickened bowel wall. And uh, another very common question is in patients with already uh, IBD diagnosis, what is the, the disease subtype? Because this is a very important question and it may affect uh, treatment strategies. Is it active disease? Is it fibrostenotic subtype? Is it fistulizing perforating? And in order to respond to those clinical questions, we need to have available multiple contrast mechanisms and adequate luminal distension. <clears throat> For that, MR enteroclysis, again, is a candidate, but also in some cases, MR enterography uh, can respond to those questions. Again, for the same reasons, MR enteroclysis uh, offering superb uh, uh, distension with high resolution uh, imaging capabilities, but in some cases, MR enterography uh, produces suboptimal distension and therefore it's really difficult to uh, detect uh, subtle disease in those uh, not well distended uh, uh, loops. But in other cases, like in this example here, uh, with uh, oral uh, administration, someone can achieve uh, adequate uh, uh, luminal distension. That's because of the presence of a highly stenotic segment. So it really depends on the type of patient and on the type of disease that uh, the patient presents with. Now, active disease has been correlated with the presence of different enhancement patterns intramural edema, transmural ulceration and mesenteric involvement in the form of inflammatory mesenteric lymph nodes or vascular engorgement. 
So three different uh, enhancement patterns have been identified. The well-known target sign where we have a, a high signal intensity inner ring that corresponds to enhanced mucosa and non-enhancing low signal intensity middle ring that corresponds to the presence of submucosal edema and an outer ring of uh, uh, enhancing area that corresponds to serosa and muscularis. And this is a very typical contrast enhancement pattern in active disease. Another pattern could be the inhomogeneous diffuse pattern, where again we have a highly inflamed mucosa being very bright, and then you have a moderate diffuse enhancement pattern that most probably reflects uh, the presence of fibrosis. And the third one is the homogeneous marked enhancement, where we have uh, uh, enhancement throughout uh, the whole bowel uh, layers uh, due to uh, transmural inflammation. A recent study demonstrated the clinical value of uh, acquiring late uh, uh, post-gadolinium uh, sequences in order to discriminate between fibrosis and uh, uh, inflammatory wall thickening. Uh, due to the fact that uh, fibrosis is well known to progressively enhance in a very slow uh, rate. Now, another method to detect uh, and to characterize uh, a patient into active disease is to show the presence of uh, submucosal edema uh, being very bright on uh, T2 uh, or uh, T2-like type of images, like in this TrueFISP case, over uh, moderate or low signal intensity in more uh, fibrotic areas. Uh, also, the presence of uh, multiple ulcerations, the so-called cobblestoning, has been correlated with active disease. And uh, uh, this is another example where it's uh, really important to be able to dis discriminate between the fibrostenotic disease and the uh, soft type of uh, uh, strictures that have a completely different uh, um, uh, treatment uh, management. For fistulizing perforating, again, a enterocolysis is capable of showing uh, this nice enteroenteric fistula. Uh, also, an uh, enterocutaneous fistula is shown here by the uh, increased uh, uh, contrast uptake due to perifistulous inflammation. Now, a third question is, uh, in, again, in patients with Crohn's disease, are there any extra intestinal complications? And for that, a enterography is perfectly capable of responding to these questions since the uh, necessity of having a, a adequate luminal distension is not uh, uh, of uh, uh, primary importance. So with uh, uh, MR enterography, someone can disclose quite easily due to the rich soft tissue contrast, inflammatory masses like this phlegmon here, or even abscesses, uh, both on true FISP and post-contrast uh, T1 weighted sequences. Now moving to the small bowel tumors, uh, MR enterocolysis and, and enterography, can be used not only to detect them and characterize them, but also to assess uh, local extension. And this is an example of a benign uh, GIST tumor where there it, it presents with the intussusception. However, there is uh, no vascular compromise due to the vivid uh, contrast enhancement of the lesion. Now, in malignant stromal tumors, MR can be used in order to characterize the different tumor components uh, to detect hemorrhoids based on increased signal intensities on T1-weighted images or necrosis based on increased signal intensity on T2. Tumor activity has been correlated with the degree of uh, gadolinium enhancement and finally MR enterocolysis and enterography uh, can be used to assess uh, treatment response. This is another example of a patient with lymphoma located in the terminal ileum, uh, a soft type of uh, uh, tumor uh, without um, significant stenosis and presence of uh, mesenteric lymph nodes uh, is depicted in, in this example. Uh, diffusion has a certain role, especially to detect and, and differentiate between patients with Crohn's disease due to the fact that lymphoma are well known to be a very hypercellular type of uh, tumors, therefore they can be depicted quite easily on the high B-value diffusion sequences. So as take-home messages, someone can claim that MR enterocolysis and MR enterography methods can demonstrate the transmural nature and extent of inflammation. They, can, they are capable of characterizing stenotic lesions. They may depict and characterize lesions beyond severe luminal stenosis as opposed to capsule endoscopy. They can identify and characterize intraperitoneal extension or extraintestinal complications. And finally, they can assess disease activity and allow accurate 
uh, Crohn's disease subtype classification.